who have worked so hard to bring peace and happiness to humanity. Most of them labored against great odds, but in the long run of things, those that were the great helpers in our times of need will not be forgotten. And for a moment, I'd like to discuss the part of Confucius in the ethical codes of mankind. Confucius was a typical Chinese, living at a time when China was in difficulties, as always, and the rest of the world was in problem, as always. But Confucius had a very simple concept of what was necessary. This concept he called the proprieties. He said there was a way of life suitable to human beings, not demanded of any other creature, but required by humanity. This code of life he called the proprieties, and said that by these proprieties we determine those who are really seeking to improve themselves and those who despotically are seeking to enslave others. The proprieties, according to Confucius, constituted together the code of the human being. The proprieties were the things we have to do to prove our humanity, and the things we must not do or we deny our humanity. According to Confucius, there was no excuse, no apology, no possibility of forgetting or overlooking the despotisms of unenlightened beings. Much of humanity was given into the keeping of despots. And these despots, in the effort to advance their own purposes and their own ambitions, enslaved and deluded the humanity in general. By deluding, he meant that they imposed upon their peoples false codes of conduct tried to bind them to a slavery to the ambition of a few rather than releasing them for the enlightenment of the entire society of humanity. So Confucius said there are things that the intelligent, superior person cannot do without insulting himself, without disliking and feeling apologetic about his own conduct without compromising his human state. The individual who lives below the humanity with which he is endowed lives below his own human existence. And if he becomes this way distorted or defaced, he then descends to a state less than the animal. Humanity has to prove itself day by day, year by year, and century by century to indicate before gods and the future the dedications we have to the improvement of our society. The Confucian proprieties were very basic. The one thing that we had to realize was that the superior person, now not this does not mean the intellectual, this is the person superior in the light of heaven, who stands before the gods of his faith as proudly announcing his own dedications. The superior person cannot and must not live below the level of his own superiority. The moment he does this, he proves conclusively his lack of this superiority, and therefore is no longer worthy of the respect of other people. The first of all of the proprieties is that the individual shall never, under any condition or any circumstance, lose control of himself. He must never allow any mood to move him from his basic integrities and his basic principles. He is not permitted anger or hate, extravagance, dissipation, or anything that defaces or degrades the divine principle within himself. He must live up to the God that dwells in him, or he cannot become a proper citizen. Therefore, in these old times, Confucius wept. 
for he found no prince ready to make him a counselor. So finally disillusioned, he passed out of this life with the simple statement, I have failed. Confucius did not fail. And after he was gone, many altars and temples were built to his memory, and his tablets of stone were carefully transcribed many times for the benefit of humanity. Confucius did not live in vain, but those who forgot his message lived in vain because of that imperfection. Now on the other side of the world, we have what are called ethical codes. These ethical codes go back for a long time. Probably one of the first is the Code of Hammurabi, King of Babylonia. The uh, Code of Hammurabi was one of the first efforts to create a system of integrities, of honor, and of rightness in the hearts and minds of a nation. Hammurabi was very particular on his thinking. He said that if a builder constructs a house, a home, or a palace, or a temple, and the materials are inferior, and that house shall fall, or be no longer useful, or require extensive repairs, under such condition the original builder is required and condemned, if not fulfilling his requirement, to rebuild that house free of charge and cost. For anything that is done badly, the doer must be punished. He must be required to mend everything that he breaks, correct everything that he perverts or misuses, and guard everything that constitutes his own integrity. There were all kinds of rules and laws that Hammurabi established, but they all summed up to one principle. One must be honest. Honesty is to keep the word. Honesty is to fulfill the promise. And honesty is to supply that which has been purchased and properly paid for. Now this was long ago. And people feel that, of course, we can't live according to the rules of Hammurabi. We are our different people. But others came along with the same essential principles. The Code Justinian is the same thing in principle. A code is a, is a standard. It is a level. To arise above it is to be greater. To fall below it is to be less. And those who fall below the code levels are usually uh, guilty of imperfections that damage themselves and other people. The Mosaic Code is another example of the same thing. Here we have the Ten Commandments, which are given by heaven for the perfection of man. We will never know just where those com commandments came from. But one thing we do know is that they are universally applicable. They are the things that we have to understand and obey. And the individual who belongs to a faith and does not keep its code is not a credit to himself and is a danger to society. Now, ethics in substance is a system or a level of integrities imposed by evolving humanity to regulate the deportment of humanity itself. An ethical code is one in which the needs and requirements of all parties concerned in a transaction are met with the same propriety, with the same integrity. A code necessary for the development of society has been imposed upon every nation and every age of civilization. There is no civilization that can rise above the need of self-discipline through an established concept of right and wrong. Today the problems of right and wrong are closing in on us again. In addition to the Mosaic Code and the Justinian Code, we had the Code Napoleon, which was essentially the same. For wherever there has been a rule, it has always been approximately the same rule. Whether in China, India, Greece, Egypt, or among the American Indians, integrities were the foundation of security. Now, if these securities are threatened, 
then the survival of the people is also threatened. And no individual can break the codes of life without bringing down some misfortune upon himself and endangering the security of others. Now this morning we're talking about the problem of science and ethics. This is a very interesting subject because the science of ethics is something we have never really attempted. Today we have opposed science to morality. We have indicated that we would prefer to accept materialism rather than to depend upon the deisms which supported and protected our forebears. But if we do insist upon a materialistic code of existence, then we must have a material, uh, proper ethics. The materialism must be controlled by ethics just as any theism or deism is. The proper control of the ethics of a material, a materialistic culture, is that every pound must have 16 ounces, except the jeweler's pound. We must have all things in fairness, honesty, and integrity, or materialism fails as all other systems have gradually deteriorated under the pressure of corruption. So if we want to be a successful materialism as a people, then we have to keep the same rules that the theist keeps. We've got to be honest, kind, fair, and just. And if we break the integrities of materialism, we destroy our system just as certainly as we could corrupt the theism. We must ever and forever remember that any system to survive must be based upon integrity and in some kind. Because without it, there can be no maintenance of the codes of civilization. Now we come to the problems of today and we find a world that is gradually downgrading integrities. We find that everything is being sacrificed for the maintenance of a materialism which is barely endurable even now. We also realize that in this crisis that is arising in international affairs, we have no line of defense against the corrosions of abuse and misuse. Therefore, we have a right to check to see if there is some form of ethics that can help us. And in this, in this morning especially, uh, Easter morning, we come face to face with the great code of ethics that has been given to Western man. We are in the presence of the magnificent account of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are in the presence of the being whom we regard as the nearest to being a perfect example of humanity as can possibly be imagined. A being that forgave it his enemies, who did good to those who despitefully used him, who gave us the Sermon on the Mount and the marvelous message of the Last Supper. Therefore, we are in the presence of a great principle of integrity. And yet, materialism does not recognize the integrity of these principles. Or if it does recognize them at all, it considers them unattainable by human beings in their present state of evolution. This is completely untrue. There is no reason in the world why a system of ethics cannot be justified scientifically. Now, scientific science more or less rejects ethics on the grounds that it is moral and metaphysical or spiritual and not provable. Yet the fact of the matter is, the scientific proof of ethics is available down to the last necessary study. And anyone who wishes to prove that uh, religion is ethical and religion is scientific can do so if they wish to give the time and thought and understanding to the problem. How then shall we try to prove scientifically the reality of idealism? How shall we demonstrate beyond all doubt that we can prove scientifically that ethics is a reality? I think the answer is very much contained in the concepts of, of science as laid down to us by Lord Bacon. Lord Bacon pointed out definitely that one of the great ways of demonstrating the validity or integrity of a belief 
is through passing it through scientific experimentalism and scientific study. In other words, it is perfectly possible to analyze religion as you would analyze any other phase of life. Politics, any economics, uh, the professions, all can be analyzed by the same basic method. And that method is to gain through the re repeated application of experiments, the proof or disproof of a belief. If a belief is destroyed in the process of checking it, the belief is not true. If the belief is strengthened by repetition and demonstrated as to be scientifically adequate, then it is entitled to a reasonable and constructive hearing before the public mind. Now, it is perfectly possible uh, to prove to the scientific thinking of an educated person the absolute necessity of ethics. Uh, we have much evidence in this condition. First of all, let us assume for a moment that we are scientists and we want to approach it this way. The first thing we have to do is to look the field over rather carefully and see what we're doing. We are trying now to prove that idealism is a practical way of life, that the individual can develop the virtues without destroying his material existence that he can build a good, better civilization with principles than without them. Now all this brings head-on into collision with materialism. But materialism itself is in a very sick condition at the moment. It has very little support from even its own believers. So we start in, we say, how do you prove something like ethics? Well, first of all, you would approach it as they might at a laboratory. You've got to examine it. You've got to study it. You've got to see how it works, what it causes, what its effects are, how it can be modified, what cannot be changed without destroying it, and make a complete study of the problem of integrity and what it means in the existence of a society. Now, there have been many things tested. We're testing the purity of water. We're testing the atmosphere. We're testing all kinds of chemicals for medical purposes. We are testing food. We are testing all types of equipment that might in one way or another affect our leisure or our business existence. We are now in the midst of a great study of computerization, which has become a tremendous fad, a fancy. It has wonderful potentials, but is already being abused. All of this scientific research that has built this up over a series of centuries, really, although the most important part has been within the last 50 years. But here we have a very careful research with its results. We have no such research in the field of ethics. We have never done anything to prove whether ethics is correct or not. We are, those who believe in it say it is right. Those who do not believe in it say it is wrong. And a great many, doesn't, uh, well, many do not know whether it is or is not wrong. Lacking this certainty, we are not sure what our condition and position in society should be. What constitutes the type of human being who can live on this planet the full span of his life and leave the planet as good as it was when he came? We don't ask him to make, make it much better because it's a big question, but we want him not to destroy something that was here when he came. Therefore, we have to have some accurate judge, some accurate code, some basic system of checking and cross-checking in order to understand what the moral life of man should be. Well, we can start with one of the most simple statements of all, what it should not be. Well, it is pretty obvious to most people that it, it should not be what it is now. Instead of being an advancing people, we are on the verge of mental and emotional breakdowns from fear, anxiety, and the loss of essential resources. Therefore, what we are doing now can scientifically be proved to be improper, improper or non-profitable. We cannot possibly build any scientific research structure to prove that what we are doing is in harmony with natural law. We do not ask it to co correspond to divine law, but we may suspect that when we get natural law where it belongs, divine law will be with it. We do not know how we to do certain things, 
but we know things we should not do and we are doing them. We are doing the very things that are dangerous to our survival. A scientific research on some of these problems could be extended to a basic study of the essential principles involved. We have now reports coming into us that our entertainment is dangerous to our integrity. We have evidence coming in of our extravagance and of the detrimental effects of this upon our health. We are aware of the wasteful condition of our economic system and we are in the desperate dilemma of our political structure. That with all these things wrong, I think a simple scientific statement could be worked up by three or four hundred top scientists to, the, to sum up the one big answer, we're in trouble. It would be almost impossible for them to give any other answer. Well, trouble does not seem to be nature's principal interest. The universe is not concerned with the problem of trying to get everybody into trouble. The uh, natural resources which we require to foster salvation and the perpetuation of our kind are threatened. Nature does not demand this. Nature does not demand crime, delinquency, demoralization, or the exhaustion of our available worldly resources. Nature demands only obedience to rules. And obedience to rules means obedience to ethics. Though you get to the point of obedience to rules, we come onto a scientific dilemma. The science does not wish to accept that there are rules above the ambitions of mortals. Science does not want to accept that there is an integrity in the universe. There is more that there is a consciousness, intelligence, a soul power, a divine principle somewhere out there. This is not scientifically provable, according to science. But there are ways in which it can be proven to the satisfaction of even a scientist if they will use the same methods that they use in establishing physical facts. The way they establish a physical fact is to see its consequences, to see what it does, how it works, what causes it, what comes out of it, and all these things, and repeat the experimentation until no doubt remains that they are basing, with, basing everything upon a solid ground. So, can we prove at the present time that what we are doing has any foundation in any fact anywhere? And it would be certainly difficult for science to prove that we have any foundation upon which to build an ethical system. Now, ethics is a little different from religion, although they are closely related. Ethics has to do with both sacred and secular matters. Ethics has to do with keeping the Ten Commandments and paying your bills. Ethics has to do with how you live with your neighbor as well as how you live with God. Therefore, ethics has to do with a code or a structure of human relationships suitable to protect the security of natural resources and advance the final purpose of evolution. We must, we must recognize this basic challenge to see what we're doing. Now, if science gets to work to find out what an ethical system is and what it can be, it has a series of research projects which could be developed over a long period of time. The first thing we might do is to prove scientifically what does not work. Now, we have plenty of evidence on that subject. We have the subjects Evidence goes back at least 5,000 years, probably further. We find that almost all civilizations have made the same mistake. And as a result of that, these civilizations have fallen. Now we like to say, I've heard people say, that the, the, the proof of the fact that the, these civilizations were not sound and not real was the fact they did fall. Well, that is commonly true. But we also have to realize that they're not necessarily the ethics that were to blame. It was deviation from the ethics. Most of the na great nations of the world were based upon dedicated persons and their original revelations to mankind as found in the great world teachers. And in every case, 
there was a period we might call a kind of golden age, a century or two perhaps, in which the dynamics of this new revelation held. Then gradually selfishness took over, and little by little the teaching was adulterated into uh, a mismatch that had no permanent value. We can prove scientifically, therefore, that what we are doing is not working. And that's a big discovery for a great many people. Why it is not working may be the next question. And this also can be subjected to all types of statistical examination. It can be proven again and again that certain policies do not work, will not work, and are not working now. We are able to demonstrate beyond any question that dishonesty is no more fortunate today than it was 2,000 years ago. The deceiver is no more in, secure, in a secure position now than he was long ago. We cannot keep the peace today for the same reason we broke it before. Everywhere we have a marvelous record of mistakes. We have a full and glowing account of everything we did wrong. And we watch as these wrongs gather up and finally destroy a civilization. So we say that civilizations were created by saints and buried by philosophers. We have to go into the circumstances of things and search for their causes. And any scientific survey of the world's history will prove conclusively that we are suffering today as we did 5,000 years ago by making the same mistakes now that we made then. And all the talking in the world will not change this fact. The only thing that can change the fact is to change the, co the code upon which it is built. Now, the great ethical codes of the West in Melville in, are based upon a physical system of culture based upon a, an idealistic or mystical code of spiritual revelation. The simple thing we're saying in this is that all great codes have a religious factor. They are not po it's not possible to bind the human being to virtue simply for the sake of being virtuous. He has to be virtuous because he believes something. He believes in virtue. He believes in integrity. He believes in the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of a divine power. As long as these beliefs are firm, he will build a morality. But if these are compromised, his morality goes with it. So we see today a great field of compromise. It is not that we forbid religion, but we downgrade it. We permit it to go comparatively unrepresented in those very areas where it is most important. We ask people to be good, honest, and virtuous for no good reason when the lack of these qualities results in an amassment of fortunes. We are being constantly torn between the poverty of virtue and the wealth of vice. This type of thing is not new. Croesus suffered from it. Alexander the Great. The Medici's had it. Hitler had it. And more will have it probably in the future. We are not breaking the same pattern. But we are proving scientifically by research, if we so desire, that the things that we are doing wrong are the same they always were and the disasters are the same that they always were. So science can come to the simple ground that it is beyond doubt that if we continue to make the same mistakes, we will continue to have the same troubles. Now this can be proven. There is no exception to it known. There is no way of escaping it. There is no way of affirming that that which was run well caused trouble. Nor is there any way of affirming successfully that that which is do cause, does badly produces immediate good. The only good that, th that vice brings is repentance. We get to be sorrowful and suffer as a result of our action. So an ethic can be built and can successfully be maintained on the basis that we all recognize that if we work from sound, constructive principles, we will have right results accordingly. If we depart from these principles, we are in trouble. And the more we depart, the deeper the troubles. So now we need 
someone, preferably science, which is very well equipped to do it, to present for us consideration a program proving conclusively what we should be doing and adding to the moral influence of the preacher the solid influence of the scientist. There is no possibility of a scientist examining the facts without recognizing the problem. But by overlooking the facts and bearing his attention upon the condition of polar bears in the subcontinent regions, we, he, we avoid all these problems. We bury them all in the, the possibility of perpetuating the hippopotami in Africa. We have all kinds of ways of exploring the Everglades. We do all kinds of things that will escape the major problem that we have in politics, professions, arts, crafts, sciences, religions. That the essential problem is get back to a foundation which can endure and eliminate as quickly as possible processes that have failed consistently, continuously, and without even one contradictory note for the last 5,000 years. We are just prolonging a condition that is not going to get any better. We are not going to be able to legislate a country into a state of peace as long as the individual citizen has no ethical convictions of his own. As long as profit is the prime motion in society, we're going to have a, rid a society riddled with loss. Now, the way of handling this is to look over and see how it has been handled and see if we can decide something that might be reasonably valuable. In the golden age of Greece, we had a brief period of security and success. And probably the greatest exponent of this was Pythagoras of Samos. Pythagoras, who incidentally finally died a martyr to stupidity, was one of the great minds of all time. He found out from personal experience that it was not possible for him to change the course of history. Therefore, he decided to do what most of the teachers have tried to do, namely to create a miniature commonwealth by which the facts could be made known. He wanted to form a microcosm of the principles upon which a surviving world could be built. Therefore, he created a, an institution at Crotona, a Dorian colony in Italy, in which he and his disciples lived together in harmony and equity. This is the for Crotona Institute, included both men and women who lived together, raised their families, but lived under the principle of integrity that they no longer were suffering from personal profit. The Pythagorean Academy was made up of persons who owned nothing, therefore had gained nothing by corruption. If by any reason or for any purpose they wished to retire from the community, their goods were returned to them. But while they was there, there was no exchanging and no uh, investing in monetary things. Pythagoras started by realizing, therefore, the danger of money as a corrupter of ethics and lived accordingly and taught accordingly. Now, of course, the great utopians, Moore, Bacon, several others, also built their imaginary commonwealths upon a complete detachment from profit. Now, the profit system is one of the, of the most dangerous that we have. On one occasion when Croesus, the wealthiest king of antiquity, showed a penniless philosopher his treasure vaults, the philosopher looked at him for a few minutes. He said, Sire, I see this extraordinary. But I tell you, a man with better iron can take away from you all of your gold. And that was what actually happened. And we have a time uh, where other philosophers have realized that wealth, private wealth, is the main foundation of public vice. Wealth is not necessarily merely a complete way of life. It is a, a, a useless tyranny of ambition over the well-being of civilization. And if there was ever a time this has been demonstrated to us in our own lifetimes, it is now. We have here time after time dictators who impoverish and bankrupt their countries. 
We have every effort made to destroy the rights and privileges of human beings in order to maintain the wealth of a few. This is against ethics. This is against the common good. Wealth beyond a certain point is only necessary because the accumulation of it has caused poverty. If it was not for the poverty resulting from wealth, it would not, there would not be very much inducement. The ambition to have is to escape the problems of those who have not. If society and ethics corrects the have-not situation, the rest of it becomes comparatively unimportant. And this is another point in ethics to consider. That the idea that we are here for some reason is something that science has not yet explored, but it certainly should. So the scientists know we are here. They're not quite sure why we are here. They have practically no understanding of where we're going. But they still could do considerably better in trying to understand what we are doing while we are here. We are here, according to the scientists, biologically, and by uh, various scientific tests, our existence can be demonstrated without reasonable doubt. But what we are here for is something that science is also now going to face. We are going to do what we are beginning already to threaten, namely that we are going to remove a large part of the prestige of science unless it begins to do something for the, work, for the working improvement of society. How is society going to find out, how is science going to find out what we are really here for? Well, we have to look over again the world and we will find that most individuals were here primarily uh, to live intelligently, kindly, and accept the daily responsibilities of family and, and civil existence. The average person was not born here to change the course of history in a, as a single individual, but with others he was here to create a new standard of history for those who come after him. For the few, however, who have special privileges at this time, it becomes obvious that the ethics must come in. There is no way of solving the problem of poverty, poverty by an occasional grant of funds. There is something wrong with a system which cannot provide the needs of its people. The people in their hands must also realize that the selfishness that afflicts them from above also self afflicts them from within themselves. The, uh, the individual who is selfish, though penniless, is a danger to society, who, as much of a danger as the wealthy person who is without morals. Everything depends upon the integrities of values, and science can very easily prove conclusively that the various materialistic ambitions of human beings are responsible for most of the crime and most of the degeneracy from which we are now suffering. We are therefore in the case where ethics becomes essential. Science not only must have a, an eye for ethics and a soul for it, but it must be willing to propaganda it in the areas where it is necessary. The close relation of science and education is a good example. What are we doing today in a major way on, in education to correct the mistakes which have burdened the search for knowledge since the beginning of history? How are we preparing young people to live better than we are living? And when we say better, we don't mean in more expensive homes. We mean on a better standard of integrity and idealism. We cannot live in a material world without idealism or the materiality will crush us. We are not supposed to. If it was intended that this material world should provide us with everything we want and everything we need, we should certainly have been given a thousand years of life instead of seventy-five or a hundred. We are not here to build upon this earth the permanent character which is necessary to the universal plan of things. This is a grade in school. We must graduate some way, even if at the foot of the school. But we are not responsible here for a complete physical immortality. Physical immortality would only mean to lengthen the prison sentence from which we already suffer. The problem is the ethics situation 
by means of which we can use our experience here to prove to our own confidence and to our own satisfaction the divine plan to which we belong. We are here to grow toward reality. And in order to grow towards reality, we have only two dynamic instruments. One is religion and the other is science. And a great ethics has to combine both. A great ethics has to be based upon religious principles and scientific procedures. The science must support this concept instead of cater to an atheism or an agnosticism, which is nothing but an attempt to escape its own mistakes and to pass off its own follies as virtues. So we are here today to consider how to put something together in the form of ethics. Well, one of the basic things is probably to go back to the old Chinese way. The place where ethics has to begin is in the personal life of the individual. When the individual demands ethics because of his own need, he will get it. Well, even if he merely reads it out of books and does not really care about it for himself, he will have the material problems that he has today. The Chinese are very simple to put the whole thing into a family basis. In the Chinese family in the good old days, the family was far superior in its ethics to the state. The Chinese emperors were not all a seemly lot by any means. But this, according to Confucius, had no bearing upon the facts. The fact that leaders are corrupt does not justify corruption. The fact that the leader is selfish and exploits the people does not justify the people being delinquent and exploiting each other. So that we have to realize that there will always be the need for a division between the, the ethical and that which is not ethical. And all that is not ethical leads to pain. And all that is ethical leads to peace. And each individual has to do it. Confucius and Mencius after him, Mencius after a good training by his mother, uh, determined the essential value of the family. Essential value of the integrity of the most intimate human relationships. In the family, today we read about child beating. We leave about parents walking off and leaving their children. We find all kinds of indifference to the need of the young because the people want to go out and have fun or have become so disillusioned with each other that they can't stand the family life any longer. All of this is something that will result finally, possibly, in the Fourth World War or something of that nature. All these little things peep together make history. And if we want a better history, we have to start in our own homes. So we think what the Chinese did, uh, what they believed. They believed that the parents were the natural guardians and proprietors of the young, and that it was their responsibility to be before, before heaven and the earth to see that their children received all necessary moral instruction, received all assistance needed to bring them to maturity with dignity and dedication that each child should grow up respecting parents, venerating the gods, and working together with others for the good of humanity. Now with this, we would have very little cause for argument, but nobody seems to have thought of this as a scientific statement. They have thought it as, of it as something that was merely an ideal. But if you could take a million homes, test them under laboratory conditions, and impose upon them these rules, you would soon realize that you are dealing with a scientific fact. That the neglected person is not going to believe in the, uh, blossom forth in the soul of integrity. A few very strong individuals rise above the problems of their own childhood, but most are heavily influenced. Especially when in today's world, the temptations are much greater than the strengths of character necessary. Absolutely, all the society also is made up of parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and uh, other annoying relatives. And uh, the need for this is for them all to realize. The relatives who later are abandoned and left in some retirement home by thoughtless children are not fulfilling the laws of life. They're not doing the things that are necessary, or nor are they enjoying the privileges 
of those who live according to a proper system of ethics. The ethics system, therefore, gives the parent the right to bring the child into maturity, and it also gives the child the right to personally decide upon the way of life which he is going to accept later. The child has the right to honor his parents and to support their efforts to help him. If there is a conflict and good parents are wayward children, there is something wrong with the grand system. For the waywardness nearly always comes from external temptation. If it is not from temptation, then it is from the corruption of the blood before birth. Or the very process of being born, which destroys something that is necessary to survival. The mature person, therefore, has the full responsibility for the society which he is creating. And the child has the responsibility of becoming a worthy and useful member of the society of human maturity. All these things are part of proof, provable science. Put the scientist with his equipment into the public school system and see if he can come out with any proof that materialism is of any benefit to anybody. If he can prove conclusively that the materialistic theories are not responsible for crime, narcotic addiction, and other deplorable situations, then maybe the idealist could stand corrected. But he'll never find it. He will realize that his indifference to the most important thing in the world and his downgrading of the one great reality, which is the basis of survival, will gradually bring his generation into the same poverty as those who have gone before. So we have now an ethics to consider. Now, an ethics is regarded as a moral code, a kind of creed, a commonly accepted level of conduct which is constructive and productive of growth without destruction and death. The The main purpose of ethics, then, is to supply the idealism necessary to the constructive way of life. Ethics deals with every relationship of life. Without ethics, the family can't last. The nation can't last. The business organization can't last. The professions are disrupted. Everywhere where we today condemn corruption, we find at the root of it the failure of ethics. There is failure on the part of principles to govern the conduct of individuals. It is terrible to think that we who have been here as a species for a long time, from the days of the Cro-Magnon or the Pithecanthropus erectus, that we have not been able in all that length of time to to create for humanity a system of culture by which it can survive. Why must we now face the mistakes of those who came before us by 100,000 or 200,000 years. There is no improvement. We've only improved the means of destroying. We've only advanced the skill of corruption. We have only added to the techniques of warfare. But we have never found peace. And they say, some of the scientists say now, that this proves beyond beyond question that there is no ethics. That there is no such a thing as morality. Well, the, this is a rather hollow statement for the simple fact that you can't judge a thing you've never done. You can't pass judgment on a way of life you have never permitted to exist. And if scientists were as busy working with these moral problems as they are in developing atomic and nuclear weaponry, we might be nearer to the way of salvation. We do need desperately to realize that the survival of the human being is now the great scientific problem. That science cannot solve it without religion. And religion and civil science working together can produce a philosophy of life that will bring us through to the next century. But why is it necessary for us to go through all of this when we have histories, we have records, we have fairly accurate accounts, of the mistakes that we have made in the past, and these are identical with the mistakes we are making now. We haven't even gained enough to make a new and unusual mistake. We have bigger ones, but they're the same ones. We used to use a flat stone or a stick to hit our man we didn't like. 
Now we throw an atomic bomb at him, but the principle is the same. We have never got over the competitiveness. In religion, we have never gotten over sectarian intolerance. We have never in society gotten through the, uh, the barrier that has been raised by classes and races. All these things continue to plague us while we go happily or unhappily on our way conquering the cosmos. It's about time to get down to do something here worth doing. And we have all that is necessary to do it with. We have the textbook of 5,000 years of doing it wrong. We also have a few occasional references to individuals who sincerely tried to do it right. And we see that in spite of all of the mistakes that have occurred, that the great names that we worship, regard, recognize, and respect are the ones who had the great ethics and not the ones who had the big laboratories. Most of the morals of mankind were established before we had a laboratory, before we had a school. They were established the, the territorial rights of animals. Everywhere there are laws governing conduct. Man feels that he has now reached the point where he can break these laws with impunity. This is his big mistake. And for this mistake he is paying a terrible price. But looking over the situation, we see how easy it is to build a strong, irrefutable statement of what it could be and how we can get to some of the things that we need. We need the leadership of the two great institutions that we have at this time. The average individual does not feel capable of overturning a system that has preyed upon him, exploited him, and terrorized him for thousands of years. Therefore, he is needing desperately the cooperation of science and the cooperation of religion. And in order to have this cooperation, they must cooperate with each other. There is no such a thing as a science that does not have its foundation in some spiritual mystery, which is unsolvable by mechanical or physical means. And there is no such a thing as a religion that does not need the scientific strength of morality and ethics. These things are part of a great pattern. But these two, science and religion, are the two great working forces. And the combining of them through a series of very astute and carefully prepared doctrines, teachings, and examples may be considered to be the great philosophy of life for, the living, for those living in our present world. We have to find an answer not just to curb a bomb or to pass a law that you can't use one that's more than ten times as strong as it is now. We cannot do it by passing laws against various tariffs uh, uh, penalizing classes or trying to get rid of dictators who, ri who rise as rapidly as they can fall down. We have got to get back to principles in a world concept of what is necessary. And what is necessary is the recognition that the great text that we all must use is the text of experience. What the world has been through tells us what the world has done and what the world must do to get over it. It is no longer a case of someone rising up with a new idea. New ideas are very rare because most of the what we call new are ones that were aborted early in their existence by selfishness. There are somewhere records of everything we need and much of it is available in the simple history of nations. We find in various histories, various accounts, and even in the old family encyclopedia, pr plenty of evidence to prove the absolute necessity of idealism as a way of life. That this idealism also represents a faith in something greater than us, and also uh, by idealism, the faith that we can be greater than we are. That we can be greater in the true sense of the word. That we can come near to that which is necessary for the restoration, restoration of society. When we come to these realizations, we will be in a much safer condition than we are now. And science can do it. And anyone that can invent a computer can invent a use for it that it does more than simply to, uh, you take the place of the bookkeeping. We create one uh, uh, discovery after another, but before we hardly have the discovery, we have locked it in the pattern of our own selfishness. 
Whatever we devise must be exploited, must be patented, the patents must be assailed, and there must be lawsuits, and in the end, it will be these discoveries will be used to further the very difficulties they were intended to relieve. It is all because there is no vital code of ethics. There is no realization of what is necessary. To go back to China for a moment, in the family, it was their law of life that each member of the family had its own place in the plan of things. Each one had its own duties, its own responsibilities. It was necessary that each one should recognize the hierarchy of family descent, that each one should be always in a certain mood. Now, as my, no, the Chinese were kind of uh, difficult people, some of them. They, they weren't all easy. And to be a good Chinese family's older son was quite a trick. There was a lot of things had to happen before this could be accomplished. And one of the things that had to happen was patience and acceptance of responsibility. A Chinese son was not permitted to have arguments and fights and knockdowns with his family. He was not permitted to be uncivil, regardless of his condition. He could not be violent. He could not do anything but prove to all concerned that he was greater in his, in his contribution of integrity to anything that could be turned against him. He had to be right in terms of the great ethics, the ethics of heaven, that the gods must lead and humanity must follow. But when mankind tries to lead and make the gods follow, there's trouble. Because there's no way of doing that without destroying the integrities of life. We are therefore now facing another problem in the situation of ethics, which will require considerable adjustment in the next few years. We're talking about ethics in the 21st century. We are looking for new ways of developing the realities of life. Well, if we want to borrow a little something from Mencius, or for an idea or two from Buddha, or perhaps something from Akhenaten, to help us find out what we ought to do in order to meet this new century, then we would be undoubtedly told very definitely that we would be required and expected to rectify our own character. We would have to become better people because we would have to deserve a better world. And while we join happily with all the world breakers, no, they will not gain the end we want. We have to rectify personal conduct. We have to make certain that in our own lives we are keeping the rules of universal ethics. And universal ethics is basically honesty. It is mental honesty, physical honesty, emotional honesty. It is also the acceptance within ourselves of the responsibility of setting the right example at all times. To discuss any subject that we do not fulfill in conduct is a waste of time. To tell people to behave themselves and then misbehave ourselves is a total loss. The individual must become a self-controlling, self-directing, in, in instrument of policy and purpose. Each of us, in a way or another, is maintaining or tearing down the social systems to which we belong. We are uh, becoming helpful or helpless. We are adding or subtracting. And at the present time, we have created a tremendous interval. On the one hand, those who have, and those on the other hand, who have not. And the very wars and commotions and revolutions and rebellions that are troubling us at the present time with many, many individuals fleeing for refuge to some other country. We find more progressive countries heavily burdened with those attempting to escape tyranny. Now all this is part of a family feud. The planet is one family. Nations are merely parts of a vast family. And when problems arise in one part of a family, it is necessary for all parts to cooperate for a solution. Now, unfortunately, in many cases, we are not cooperating for a solution. We are exploiting the animosities of other nations in order to create better markets and do various things that seem to be expeditious at the moment. Nothing that is contrary to ethics is best for the moment or any other time. And as we watch, we find that the compromises of principle 
resulting from the emergencies of the moment are simply adding to the trouble and making the, the collapse more immediate. We have to start in somewhere to do the very best that we can. And therefore, there should be educational material available in the public school. The public school is the source of the young people who are going to have to take over this world in the early years of the next century. These young people should not go out with nothing but the ignorance which we now use as the standard of graduation. They should not go out without integrities and without idealism. Now we are told, of course, that it is not right to teach religion in the public school. I think this is a mistake. It's not the religion we're worrying about. It's theology. Theologies conflict. Religion does not. There is probably not one person in a hundred you know, who is considered seriously religious, whose basic principles differ from those of others equally religious. The Buddhist has the same code as the Christian. The Jew works used with the same Old Testament as the Christian. The Brahmin and the Hindu has the same code of integrities. They have the same consideration for the young. They have the same honor for virtues. We find it in Japan, in Buddhism, and in Shinto. We find in Shinto, for example, what we regard as an exaggerated respect for the country. We feel that the Shintoists, about 60 or 70 million of them, are really going to get very, very foolish because their philosophy means that their religion is based upon the protection and security of the nation, not, their, not a personal condition. The Shintoist believes that he is part of a system which protects the world in which he lives. Well, it seems about that might not be a bad little note to add to our problem. That we are here not only to redo, become religious for our own sake, but to add something to the positive uh, recognition of our responsibilities of citizenship and our responsibilities of family and friendship. That a good friend is an honor to a nation. An enemy is an enemy to the state, even though it be limited to the, someone we don't like. All the negative things danger the whole. The good things advance the whole. Then we find other religions in different places, whether it's the American Indian with his simple creed, or the South African with his, or whatever it may be. The, almost all religions have the same message. They have the same message, be honest, be kind, pay your bills, respect the rights of others, worship God, Take care of your children and refrain from uh, avarice, selfishness, and moral corruption. Now, these types of things are not just the beliefs of the people. They are the foundations of an enduring culture. We have tried doing without them, and we're in this most serious trouble. And the only ones in our communities who are not in that trouble are those who have kept these principles or have come to know them and honor them. So we have to really get down to a world ethics, certainly to a national ethics. This should be taught in the public school. It should apply to the election of, of officials to government. It should be taken by all of the professions, the law profession, the medical profession, all the great systems of specialized learning that we have should be bound together by one tremendous moral truth, ethics, namely that none one, no one in any of those professions shall abuse power, shall abuse wealth, shall overcharge for his services, or participate in any corruption or compromise of the ideals of peace and brotherhood. These uh, facts we, can be proven, and we can prove that these things do work. And of course, in Christianity, which we are especially honoring today, we realize how definitely a dedication of a handful of dedicated and devout persons has resulted in a, the largest religion the world has ever known, a religion which has now become an amazing mass of sects and creeds. The point now is to bring them together, to say that ethics means that we shall honor all who seek the same truths that we seek. 
desire to accomplish the same ends that we desire and have realizing conclusively that the morality of the Sermon on the Mount is not a reality or a problem for a single creed but is essential to devotion to all the religions of mankind. We can get over creedalism if we go beyond theology and enter into the principles of nature. Ethics coming through science could prove to us that the Ten Commandments are correct scientifically, biologically, historically, politically, and culturally. These are all principles which have proven and stood the test of ages. They are continuing to lead us in the way that we should go if we will obey them. But if we do not obey them, then we have no ethics. We have no ethics where exploitation comes in. We have no ethics where principles are compromised. And no ethics where nations cannot arbitrate their differences. And that we should live now, 5,000 years after the rise of nations, without having a better answer and a better solution proves conclusively that learning as we know it has not been aimed at solution. Le learning has become a, a, an instrument of exploitation. It has become a way of getting rich and not a way of getting good. Today we graduate the physician so that he goes into a highly uh, uh, expensive profession. What he really needs is to restate in his own consciousness the Hippocratic oath that he is a servant of the God of, we of health, not the God of wealth. This point is the same in all professions. Ethics, therefore, is honesty. It is nothing more or less than doing what we know to be right in the first place and gradually learning to overcome the tendency in ourselves to yield to temptations. If we keep as we are, there will be no medicine because we cannot maintain it. When we cannot maintain a system, in which exploitation becomes so general that no one can afford to live in it. This means revolution. Then we start all over again, fighting it out, slugging it out, and keep on going until humanity wakes to the simple fact that we are here to learn something. And the longer we take to learn it, the more we're going to suffer. And it's getting to the point now where the suffering is beginning to pinch more people. It beginning to be uh, available as a, an incentive to change things. We are now having a great revival of recognition of religious value. We have managed gradually to uh, recognize that there is an ethic that is not man-made, but must be man-administered. We are not creating the ethics. The world is, is manifesting them. But they are just as real as the sunshine and, and the moon. They are something that was there from ever, forever and will be forever because none of the ma uh, machinery of existence can work without them. We have therefore about time to wake up to the fact that if we love our country, if we love our children, love our families, and look for the common good, that it is time for us to begin to practice the ethics which is based upon the experience of ages. The ethics that has come to us because it was necessary. We were, we were intended in the beginning to be kind to each other. When kindness failed, we lost ground. And with the failure of kindness, corruption gets, gets stronger. When the failing of tolerance, intolerance increases. With the failure of the love of brotherhood, war increases. The failures of values result in the rise of corruptions. They're all based upon failing to nurture and protect the better things that are within ourselves. So the time has come very definitely to think about it. And we might ask some of our big scientists sometime to make a good graph of what it would be to like if we could see the scientific development of integrity, the scientific value of ethics, and how we can prove beyond any reasonable doubt that we cannot achieve civilization without a principle or a code that justifies existence. We have over 150 nations now, most of them in trouble, nearly all of them struggling for existence against what seem to be insurmountable obstacles. 24 hours of world honesty would cure most of it. 
it would give it a little breather and people would see what it was like if instead of fighting over their differences, they united over their common needs and responsibilities. We have built a competitive system in a world in which ethics alone can succeed. We cannot complete, compete and survive. Cooperation and not competition is the life of tri trade. Everywhere, the more we give, the more we can have. The, everywhere, the more we chisel, the less we will have. Everything can be scientifically proven. We can prove every ethics and every m m morality of importance in the history of the world. That these things were the truth and competition was a lie. That we are a materialistic civilization is an untruth. We are actually the visible manifestation of a divine program. We are here because of the integrities of a universal law much greater than ourselves. If we destroy the world on which we live, it will not be the vengeance of God, but the corruption of mortals. If we want to preserve this to a better way, then we must preserve it by our own integrities. We created the world because the, de the deities found it necessary to give us this environment. We have continued in this world su hoping and suffering and doubting because of our own abuses of something essentially good, proper, and generous in the beginning. We now must take the, the world that we have torn apart and put it together again. And if we haven't the courage and the wisdom and the insight to do this, we will not have a better generation to come. Ethics means the victory of kindness over cruelty, of love over hate, of good over evil, and of the immortal principles of faith over the mortal principles of corruption. We are a divine creation, and when we became the prodigal son, I wasted our provinces and properties and by in riotous living, we destroyed the purpose for which we were created. This purpose must be revived and restored. We cannot do it unless learned professions join in helping us to make this possible. We got to give it a start. If we could get ten years of it well established in our public school system, we would be much safer when we go into the next generation. But to go into the future with a generation of young people who have nothing on their minds but rock music and uh, television programs, who have nothing more to live for than the competition of sports, who have nothing to hope for but profit in some investment or some scallywag enterprise, or who will sacrifice their health and their lives maybe in, for narcotics. We will have continued suicide of the young as long as we give them nothing to live for. And we give them nothing to live for when we take their ideals away from them and tell them to go out and try to find uh, in rock music or in the back alleys a, mo a noble purpose for life. Life is sacred. Life is purpose. And it is up to those who are in authority to make sure that this is known. That we are not wasting bodies, we are wasting lives. We are not wasting a few physical energies, but we are wasting the talents that come through at birth to all who come into this world. We are now being born crippled by a background that has no place in it for the integrities. And we have to correct this. The child coming into this life is entitled to a healthy body, but he cannot have that if its parents are on narcotics. The child coming in is entitled to a good education, but it cannot have that when every ideal is cut out of the classroom. The child coming in is entitled to a good job, one suitable to his attainments and made possible by moderation in all things. If he cannot have a decent job and cannot live on the level of integrity, he is bound to get into trouble. The great wealth at one end and the great poverty of the other are monuments to ignorance, monuments to corruption, and complete failures in religion and ethics. That they were allowed to endure is simply because they cater to the weaknesses of human nature. And we have not been given the incentives to strengthen our inner resources. We have within ourselves the power to be anything that we really want to be. But we have not been given the inspiration to want to be anything. 
therefore, as the waiting, hopefully, for the resurrection of the world. And the symbol of the resurrection is now this Easter Sunday. And on this Sunday, we hope that a spirit of resurrection will touch the affairs of mortals so that we will begin to bring our deeds into the mean of our needs, that we will continue to grow as we were intended to grow, and in the due course of time, fulfill the noble destiny for which we were created. All these things must come, and today we need an ethics, and science can give us absolute proof that our mistakes cannot succeed, that our troubles will only end when we stop causing them. And if this is caught in mind, I think we have something to build towards another Easter with greater hope. Thank you.